We noted that principle of incarnation where we begin until we come to Christ, realizing He identified with us, even to willingness to bear our sins to the cross. And that's where our life changes. And by virtue of what Christ has done and our coming to Him, we begin to live a life that in some way reflects His own decision when He emptied Himself, renounced His own rights, and took the form of a servant, becoming obedient unto death. Easier said than done, but at least that's the foundation upon which we build our lifestyle. And when you are known as a servant, you never lack an opportunity to make some disciples. Because people will know that you care about them, that you love them, and you give credibility now to your witness and earn the right to be heard. It's not easy to keep that in focus as demands increase, but you are conscious of your ultimate objective, which is to reproduce disciples as you yourself are one with the objective of someday seeing the Great Commission fulfilled with all the nations gathered to worship Him who is worthy. And as God leads some into our life in a special way, we want to be together. That principle of association, much like a family relationship, which is the way we come into the world, and it's the context out of which our life now evolves. We never get away from it, and it's by being together that we continually are learning especially with those few that are closest to us, beginning in the family, reaching out to friends, persons that we work beside every day. Not that we minimize the larger group that we have contact with, and we seek to do what we can to spread the good news to a larger group, but we realize that most of the time we're going to be with a few, and that's where the priority lies in disciple-making. In that context, we can learn together what it means to follow Christ, to obey Him, which is the expression of our faith, and motivated always by our love for Him who loved us even while we were sinners, a love that grows as we follow Him. But that brings us now to the next principle of demonstration. And you'll notice that there's nothing new in these principles. They're basically common sense. And they come together. I use some sort of an outline here just for the sake of organizing our thought. But in practice, you never separate them. When you do one, you're doing also the others. But Jesus, as they continue to follow Him, is giving them an example of how to live. Take His way of communion with the Father. They notice that Jesus would frequently go away to the desert or to the mountain to pray. We have the account of the disciples seeing Jesus coming down from the mountain one morning. He must have gotten up early to go there to have his time alone with the Father. And they put it together, the extraordinary way that his compassion overflows in life and the way he gets alone to be with the Father. And that morning, you remember, he, as he came down, they, they saw him and they said, Master, would you teach us to pray? It's interesting, they've been reading prayers, hearing prayers in the synagogue all their life. But there was something about the prayer life of Jesus they wanted to learn. And on this occasion, he says, all right, this is the way you can pray. And he lifted his eyes to heaven and began to say, as you know, our Father 
who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. He puts the attention on the Father. Now, those words are not repeated again, except perhaps on one other occasion. The inference is that soon those disciples learn to pray without being prodded. But in the beginning, he gave them an example. Isn't that the way we have learned to pray? Without realizing it, our first prayers probably reflected how we had seen our mother or father or pastor or some friend pray, because we learn best by imitation. And that's what Jesus was doing all the time they were together. They noticed how he frequently used the Old Testament scriptures. 166 times words of the Old Testament are recorded on the lips of Jesus as he teaches. And they realize this is his textbook. This is where he finds authority for his message. And often he calls their attention what is written in this book is being fulfilled in his life. They learn to depend upon Holy Scripture just as their Lord. Certainly they could see the compassion of Christ overflow in the way that he would care for people, responding to their heartbreak as he would meet these needs throughout his journey. In that process, of course, they learned how he would communicate God's love, how he would share the gospel, how evangelism flowed through just the normal way that Jesus was living. There are probably 35 episodes that are mentioned in the four Gospels, but only a few in any detail, like the woman at the well or Nicodemus, or take Zacchaeus there in Jericho in the 19th chapter of Luke. As Jesus is passing through the city on His way to Jerusalem for the last time, the crowd has turned out to see Him, because people have heard now about His mighty works, and they, they're anxious to know a little more, at least to look upon Him. And one of them was the tax collector. He had probably dismissed the Roman guard that was at his tax office so that he could go and join the throng. Pushing his way through the crowd, he wanted to get up close, but when the people saw him, I can imagine how they shoved him back to the edge of the crowd. They had no love in their heart for this man. But he was a person of some ingenuity. Just to get his job implied that, because it meant he had to get authorization from the Roman oppressors, probably a bribe. No wonder they wanted him to be in the back of the crowd. But he spied in the distance that old sycamore tree, and I can see him run up that side street and through that alley and then jump up into the tree and climb on that branch that overhangs the dusty thoroughfare. And as he pushes aside the leaves, he strains to look in the distance and first sees his Lord. And I expect his reaction was one of surprise, because as the prophet Isaiah had said, there was no beauty that Jesus would be desired among men. He was a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. But as Zacchaeus looked into his face as he drew closer, he saw something there that he had never seen in the face of a man before. It was something he couldn't explain, but it seemed that some great compassion reached out from his life and embraced that whole multitude of people. Oh, how his heart must have been beating faster. How he must have wondered if these things he'd heard about Christ could actually be true. How he had healed the sick and opened the eyes of the blind. How it was even reported he raised the dead how it was said that even one of his own followers was a tax collector, Matthew by name. But Jesus will soon have passed this way, but as he draws beneath the tree, he stops. He looks up and he says, Zacchaeus, come on down. 
because today I must stay in your house. Can you imagine how Zacchaeus felt? If you had been in his place that day, how would you have felt if you had looked directly into the face of the Son of God and you knew he was talking to you? You're the one now in the midst of this crowd that has a personal audience with the king. And he thinks to himself, I believe Jesus knows me. You know, he could have found out a lot about Zacchaeus by talking with Matthew. And it behooves us to learn as much as we can about people that we would like to reach. Yes, he doubtless knew how Zacchaeus had been pushed aside, how he had become a hated man among his countrymen. But Zacchaeus realized more than that. Something about Jesus reminded him that there is a better way. He's interested in me. And he's thinking to himself, he not only calls me by my name, he's inviting himself home with me. I believe Jesus wants to be with me. Isn't that why home is a special place, different from any other place on earth? And you can be pushed around all during the day, but when you go home, it's different. You're somebody. And there's a place reserved just for you at the dinner table. There's no place like home. Jesus continually makes his disciples aware he wants to be with them. Yes, Zacchaeus realized that among the other people, he was considered an outcast. They'd given up on him long before. But the one the people had come out to see had now turned attention to Zacchaeus, the biggest sinner in town. And Zacchaeus was thinking to himself, I believe he loves me. You remember when that realization came into your heart? That in spite of all that God knows about you, how you had fallen, how you had turned to your own way, yet Jesus never gave up on you. He was still seeking you. He had something in mind for you that no one on earth could ever do. Yes, the realization that I am loved by God. Don't ever forget it, because there are many people that you probably know that have no idea that they're loved, at least by God. But when that comes into your thinking, into your heart, you've got to respond. And I'm glad that that account does not close without telling us Zacchaeus made haste and right there on that street, he made his peace with God. Well, I expect there were some in the crowd that began to, to laugh. Look at this old man suddenly getting religion. But I don't think it made any difference to Zacchaeus what the unbelieving crowd thought. For the first time in his life, he met someone who really cared for his soul. And I can see Jesus putting his arm around him and then going back to the house with his friend and those disciples coming along behind him. There's a lot that hasn't yet been explained, but they can talk about those things when they get back home. They deal with this matter of restitution. But Jesus is careful to assure Zacchaeus that he too is a child of Abraham, a man of faith. But he also says, I want you to know Zacchaeus, why I came this way today. The Son of Man, you see, came into the world to seek and to save lost. Zacchaeus needed to hear that, but also those disciples who were with him. This was an object lesson in evangelism. This is the way Jesus was teaching all through his life, giving an example, giving a demonstration of his teaching, 
That's the way we learn most naturally. And as people look at us, they can see our priorities and our values lived out. We can share with them the inner life of our soul. We can share with them our prayer concerns and answers to prayer and make clear what is meant by personal ministry. Of course, they will also observe our shortcomings after they've been with us a while. They'll see what's wrong with us. And that can be threatening, especially if you're looked upon as somewhat of a religious leader. But you've got to be honest. As much as you can, you want to be transparent. And when you have established a relationship of trust, then you can share your burdens, your shortcomings. You can even tell them your sins and you can confess them. I hope you have somebody close enough to you that you can unburden your heart to. And it's usually when you get to this place that the relationship is coming together, much like a family. You know, the burdens of this world are so heavy, we can't carry all the burdens alone. But oh, the joy of having someone that you can come to and really share your brokenness, your heartbreak, your sorrows, along with your anticipations and your need for more grace. It's a principle of demonstration all the way through our life. But that very naturally leads to what I call the next principle of delegation. 